But now, back to what we're all really here for and our first talk of the afternoon. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Alice. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Are we all good? Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, let me see how this clicker works. So this is me. I realized when I made this slide, this photo of me would be massive. I only realized it when it was too late. So sorry about that. Um, but yes, I'm Alice Owens. I'm a principal software engineer in Liberty IT. Um, and my kind of day to day work is ML ops. So I thought that's what I would talk to you a little bit about today. Um, so I guess what is ML ops? So there's this quote I kind of think explains it well, and it's that it stands for machine learning operations. And it kind of refers to that management of this machine learning lifecycle. So I guess kind of taking a step back, um, what is machine learning? I think there's obviously growing awareness of what it is with ChatGPT and everything, but um, it is a subset of AI, and I guess at like a really simple level. I know we've talked about kind of different models today, but um, I think of almost a simple example of a machine learning model would be this program that can see patterns in data, um, and some models can make predictions then based on data that they've never seen before. Um, so there's kind of a simple example in this slide, which is pretty much, say, I wanted to train a model to detect spam email. So I might have a big data set. I might have all this metadata about email. Um, and then I would feed all that into a model. And it would obviously learn the patterns in that and map what kind of features correlate to spam. Um, and then when I've got that trained model, it will be able to look at unseen email and then make a prediction. Is it spam or not? Um, OK, so then. These kind of models, also that's a simple example, but in the commercial setting, you're going to have lots of very complicated models. Um, and so they're going to probably sit in this kind of machine learning life cycle. So if a company wants to develop a model, they're going to kind of start in the beginning and prepare the training data. So they're maybe going to pull data from databases, cleanse it, and that sort of thing, and get it ready. Um, and then step two is actually training your model. So that's kind of where the data scientists come in. Um, they will experiment with different types of models and um, different settings and things like that um, to kind of get the most accurate model for the use case um, that they're training it for. Um, and then step three would be actually deploying that model out in an environment that it can be used in. Um, so maybe that's behind an API or something. And so you can get requests that come in, hit the API, hit the model, and then you'll get a response back. Um, and then the kind of final step of that cycle, which is kind of an ongoing thing really, um, is to monitor the health of the model. So um, you want to check that there's no errors there um, and that it looks good. So kind of like any sort of app that you develop. Um, okay, so then challenges. So there's kind of challenges that are kind of quite specific to this machine learning life cycle. Um, so a big one is working with really large volumes of data. So it could be like millions of rows of data that you're plugging into these models. Um, and then with that, obviously, there's issues with maybe incomplete data. You've maybe got data that's formatted differently in different tables. It has to be merged. Um, and that can cause different issues. Um, another thing is keeping track of the data and settings that you actually use during model training. So when a data scientist, when they kind of train these models, they're trying lots of different things, so different model types, different settings. Um, and they may end up producing a good model, and then they can't remember what they used to do it. Um, so that's another part, actually making it really easy to keep track of those things. Um, and then the final thing as well is dealing with changing model input data. So this is kind of, I'll talk a bit about this later, but um, if you train a model on older data and you deploy it out into production, say, and you're getting requests coming in, sometimes the kind of statistical nature of that data can be a bit different than what you train the model with, um, and that can make the predictions a bit less accurate. So this is kind of then where MLOps comes in. So um, I mean, there are so many tools and techniques to use um, that can kind of manage some of these challenges um, in the life cycle. Um, but I'm going to look at just three today. Um, so Pydantic is one, and um, Great Expectations is another one, and then Apache Airflow. So starting off um, with Pydantic, so this is a data validation tool, um, and data validation is very important in machine learning models. I've kind of used this email example from earlier. So if you kind of imagine you have all this metadata on emails, and say you've got, I think, one variable. I highlighted it there, like the number of attachments in an email, for example. 
Um, and say in some pieces of data, that's a number, maybe you've pulled them from one database, and then you've got another database, you've pulled some, and for some reason, the number's in a word form. It probably wouldn't be, but just pretend for this example. Um, so what would happen is, if you tried to train a machine learning model on this, pro probably one of two things. One, you would get an error because it would say, OK, well, I expect this column to be one type, and there's conflicting types here. Or the model might train successfully, but then it wouldn't be as accurate in its training. Um, so you might get, because it'll essentially see those as two different pieces of data. Um, and then that kind of pattern recognition um, thing that models are so good at, it, you're losing some of that because it's going to see two different pieces of data when really it's just one. Um, so this is kind of where Pydantic comes in a little bit. Um, it's a Python library, so if you know Python, you can use this. Um, and you basically define a class that kind of represents your data. So I put here like an email data class, and then you put in your different variables. So you know your subject, body, whatever kind of data you have, and then you define a type. So is that a string? Is it a number? Um, and then what you can also do is kind of like some custom checks. So I'd added one for this example. OK, we can check if any of those fields that we expect to be numbers, if they have a string in them, can that somehow be converted to a valid number? And if it is, then we can do that. And so we're not losing that information. Um, yeah, so when you go to use this, then you can take all your data. So this could be at different stages in the cycle. This could be um, when you're, tr like you're preparing your training data, you could feed it through this class to check it matches your requirements. Or it can be after you've deployed the model out um, and you've got these requests coming in. Um, you can feed them through your Pydantic class first. It will do all your type checking for you. And then if that passes the check, you can send it on to the model. And if not, you can maybe send a rejection back um, just to let the user know that that wasn't a valid request. Let's see that slide wrong. Oh, yeah, perfect. OK, so that's kind of a quick summary of Pydantic. Um, so in the next tool, I'm going to look at is great expectations. Um, and this deals with data drift. So I guess, what is data drift? That's it's kind of what I mentioned earlier, of that statistical nature of the data changing. Um, so this would be, in terms of that email example, um, say you had trained a model to predict spam email, and it was on really old emails from like years ago. And maybe the spam emails back then, they used to send a lot of attachments and wanted people to open the attachment. And then maybe over time, say the nature of those emails changed, and they started to include more links instead, and tried to get the user to click to a different link. Um, the model will then be essentially not as effective because it's looking for something different. So when it gets new data coming in, say through that API, the main feature it's kind of looking for is probably number of attachments. But that isn't really representative of what a spam email is today. Um, so this is kind of where this data drift detection tool comes in. So to, what we kind of do is it's a Python library or a cloud offering. I've kind of looked at the Python library here. And what it lets you do is you can essentially profile all your training data. So you get all these stats on the data that you train the model with. So like what are the average of different columns and all these kind of metrics. And then what you can do is after you deploy this model out into production and you're getting your requests coming in, you can kind of say, for example, like every week, let's look at the last um, kind of batch of data in production in the last week and let's run these same stats on that and compare them. And then what you'll get is you can kind of see, is there a change in that data? So I think there's a couple of examples here. I've kind of said, um, OK, here's a couple of these expectations, the library calls them. Um, so I've profiled the data, and I've said, OK, I expect the number of attachments in these emails to be between like 0 and 1, for example. And then I'll run my data through that. And essentially, it'll tell me if it passes the checks or not. So if it passes, it'll be successful. And then if it fails, you'll obviously get a failure. Um, and then what I'll do is define some kind of action to happen from failure. So it could be an email is sent to the team that managed this model. And then what they can do is take action on that. So most typically, it means a model retrain. We need to retrain the model on the new data and update that model. OK, and then the last tool I'm going to look at is Apache Airflow. Um, I'm kind of talking about this in context of machine learning, but you could use this kind of tool for um, any kind of pipeline, um, because a pipeline is really just a series of tasks. So, um, But it's very useful in machine learning, because these projects are very often um, tasks that are kind of sequential. So um, with Apache Airflow, what you do is you define what they call a DAG, which is basically just some code, and you 
put all your tasks in it that you want to do. So I've kind of done an example there, a machine learning pipeline. You might do some data pre-processing, some validation, and training your model. And these are all different tasks. Um, and then what's nice about Airflow is you can like define what tasks are dependent on others. So I could have two tasks running in parallel, but then I might have another task, and it's dependent on the outcome um, of the previous one. So basically, you define all those dependencies. And then Airflow will give you like a very nice UI. So you define all your tasks, your dependencies, and then Airflow will put it all behind this nice UI. Um, and you can see kind of on the left-hand side, you've got those are like the three tasks that I defined. And then the, almost the columns there you can see are the different runs. So then I can start running all of these pipelines whenever I want. Um, and you can also schedule them in Airflow. So you could say, I'll run this like every two days or whatever. Um, so it automates them for you too, if that's what you want. Um, and then what you can do is you can click in the different tasks and runs, and you can get a lot of information. So you can see like task duration, you can get your logs, um, and all that kind of thing. So if you've got, for example, a failed task, you can click in and see why it failed, and kind of get your logs and sort of do your debugging in that sort of way. OK, so that's kind of a quick summary of that one. So that's basically the three tools. Um, so key takeaways, I think, from just what I've covered today, um, so MLOps is the management of this ML lifecycle. Um, and then Pydantic, really good library for data validation. Um, great expectations, great for data drift. Um, and then Airflow, a really good platform um, to schedule and manage pipelines and workflows. Um, I think that's me. Put them in time. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.